welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon. Original air dates October 24th, 1949, and the title is The Missing Money. Hope you enjoy, and again, thanks for listening. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one new husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Hey, stop! Stop! (laughs) Have you heard about it? It's amazing! It's terrific! It's your big chance of a lifetime to get five all-new, brand-new, pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books. All yours for only 15 cents and one box top from a package of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Stand by. Hear about this sensational offer in just a few minutes. The owner of the Nugget Mining Company near Selkirk was a man known as Mr. Barry Dexter. Dexter had come to the Yukon the year before. And after buying the mine, had settled in Selkirk with his wife and 13-year-old son. Now, Dexter had an office in town and employed Gil Morris as manager of the mining headquarters outside of Selkirk. Dexter rarely went to the mine, preferring to leave things to Morris. Fall was approaching when Barry Dexter, with his wife and boy, returned from a trip to Dawson City. The following morning, he was in his office when Gil Morris entered... Good morning, Gil. How's everything at the mine? Morning, Mr. Dexter. Things are going along fine out there, sir. Have a nice trip to Dawson City? Yes, but the boat was rather crowded coming back. I suppose you came in for the payroll. That's right, I did. My office clerk brought the money over from the bank a while ago. I'll uh, count it out for you shortly. Lock it in the bank for you to take out to the cashier at the mine. Gee, by the way, how's old Herndon, the cashier, getting along out there? Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dexter, Herndon quit. Left for the States on the boat last week. Said he couldn't face another hard winter up here. So Herndon resigned, eh? He was old, but a very good cashier. What have you done about the vacancy? Oh, it was filled right away, sir. Oh? Uh, Herndon told me about a chap he knew worked in the bank up at Indian Creek. He came there about six months ago. I see. Hernan got in touch with him, had him come to see me about the job just before he quit. Why did he want to leave the bank? Well, this job pays more. He needs money bad, Mr. Dexter. Uh Has a girl about eight years old, a wife who's an invalid. Seems a skittish horse threw her a couple of months ago. She hasn't been able to walk since. That's too bad. Yes, it is. Jackson hopes to get enough money someday to pay a good surgeon to examine her. Maybe do something for her. Jackson, did you say? Oh, yes. That's his name, Perry Jackson. Uh, they live in that rather shabby little cabin at the east end of town. Perry Jackson. And he arrived at Indian Creek about six months ago? That's right. Came from Seattle, I understand. I see. So he's a new cashier out of the mine, huh? Yes, sir. I suppose you will follow the usual routine with uh, Jackson, as you did with Herndon. Carry the lock bag containing the payroll to him and have him open it with the key I left out there. That's right. You have the only other key to lock it with. As long as you handle the money here and he's responsible for it out there, I'd rather not have a key to the bag. 
Yes, of course. Well, I'll get the money from the sea. I hope that fellow is honest, since he's a badly piece of cash. Oh, I'm sure he is, Mr. Dexter. Here's the cash. Put the bag on my desk and open it up. All right. It is. Well, the cash is tied up as usual in bundles of $500 each. Now, here are 11 bundles to make the necessary 5500 for the payroll. I'll put them in. Barry Dexter bundles. counted the bundles of cash as he put them in the small black bag under the watchful eyes of Gil Morris. Finally, all 11 bundles were in. Then, as Mr. Dexter closed the bag and reached into his pocket for the key, he spoke to Morris. Oh, uh, see, by the way, Gil... Uh... Step into the back office and tell my office clerk, Joe, that I want him to ride out to the mine with you. I've, I've heard of holdups in this vicinity lately. Hmm. Well, in that case, I'll be glad to have him along. I'll get him right away. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Mr. Dexter says for you to ride out the mine with me while I take the payroll. All right, Gil. I'll be right with you. I'll be waiting out here. With you, there's the payroll all locked up and ready to go. Good. Joe says he'll be right out. Then we'll be on our way to the mine. Gil and Joe arrived at the mine headquarters safely and turned the bag over to the new cashier, Perry Jackson. Joe went back to town, and Gil Morris left Jackson alone in the mine headquarters office to make up the payroll. After Gil had checked on the workers in the mining shaft, he returned to the mining office. As he went up the steps of the building, the door was suddenly flung open and Perry Jackson rushed out. <coughs> You almost knocked me down, Jackson. But you rushed. I was just coming out to find you, Mr. Morris. The payroll's short. Short? Can't be. Come and see for yourself, sir. Yeah, right over here. Yeah, look there. Ten bundles when there should be eleven. There's five hundred dollars short. Mr. Dexter must have made a mistake. Now, hold on, he... Jackson. He didn't make any mistake. I saw him put eleven bundles in that bag. You're making a mistake if you think you could pull a fast one like that. I tell you, when I unlocked the bag and took out the money, only ten were in it. Joe rode with me all the way. The bag was locked. Only you and the boss have keys to it. And I know he put in eleven. Now get your hat. We're going in to talk to the constable right now. And I'm willing to... No, pet- no, I won't. You can't blame me for taking the money. I'm leaving here now. Wait, or I'll get out of my way. No! Oh! <laughs> i got to get away quick. I won't let them send me to prison. I won't. It was two days later when Sergeant Preston, with his great dog, King, stopped at the constable's office and heard the story of the payroll robbery. Then Sergeant Preston and King reached Perry Jackson's cabin. Sergeant, I feel so helpless. I suppose you know about, about Perry. Yes, the constable told me. Does Sally know anything about it? No, I, I said her father had gone away for a few days. Good. I'm sure it's some mistake that Perry wouldn't steal. I thought that somehow he'd get word to you me. You made a mistake by running away, Mrs. Jackson. Yes, I, I suppose so. But he's been through so much. Since my legs were paralyzed, Perry's been tense and worried. He thought with this new job... That Sergeant, what's going to happen to us now? You said you believed Perry to be innocent of the charges made against him, didn't you? Yes, yes, of course. Then let your faith be strong enough to face things calmly for Sally's sake until we get this matter straightened out. I'll try, Sergeant. But not knowing where he is... King and I are going to try to find her husband and bring him back to Selkirk. Put him here and cut out the truth. If he isn't... Oh, I feel sure he isn't. In that case, you can help us. Do you have something that belongs to Perry or... Glove or some other article of clothing? You'll find his gloves in, in the pocket of his coat hanging on a hook in the front room, Sergeant. Please find him and tell him I believe in him, that Sally and I are waiting. I'll do my best to find him, Mrs. Jackson, and I'll tell him what you said. I'll get the glove on the way out. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sergeant. Oh, golly, sure is fun to play with, Sergeant. King likes you, Sally. <laughs> Oh, here's what I want. What are you taking Daddy's glove for? Well, you see, Sally, when I let King sniff this glove, he'll know that I want him to find your Daddy, and he'll pick up the trail from the scent. Oh, golly. Honest, King is awful smart. Yes, he is. Come along, King. We have to go, boy. 
Daddy said he was going to get a lot of money quick so as to get Mama to Seattle where he'll get a doctor to make her walk again. Oh. Guess I'll have to wait for a dog. Yes, I guess maybe you will, Sally. But someday you'll get one. Be a good girl now. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so Jackson told Sally that he was going to get a lot of money quick. King, I hate to think it, but it looks as though we're going to bring him back to face a prison term. Steady, Blanky. Get up there. We'll continue our story in just a moment. You've seen him in the movies. You've heard him on the radio. And here he is. What's up, Doc? Yes, here's your favorite of favorites, Bugs Bunny, in some brand new comic books, all for you. Yes, here's your chance to get five. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books. All five, believe it or not, for only 15 cents and one box top from delicious Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. An exclusive offer. And these are stories you've never seen or read before. Every story is different. Every story is complete. Every story is in full color. Yes, you get five Bugs Bunny comic books, each 32 pages thick. The whole set has 160 pages, jam-packed with adventures, laughs, fun, and excitement. Wow, Doc, what an offer. Take a look at this thriller. Bugs Bunny outwits the smugglers. Bugs starts out as a beachcomber, ends up on a ship full of seagoing jewel smugglers. But Bugs is no dumb bunny, no siree. How does he outsmart them? Read all about it in Bugs Bunny Outwits the Smugglers. And say, you'll have thrills and chills when you read Bugs Bunny Lost in the Frozen North. The Arctic Circle makes bugs go round in circles. Polar bears, penguins, frozen treasure, an adventure a minute for Bugs Bunny in this exciting story. Don't miss it. Don't miss any of these action-packed stories. Bugs Bunny captured by cannibals. Bugs Bunny joins the Marines. Bugs Bunny's rocket to the moon. And many, many more. Yes, we'll not only send you five different comic books, we'll also let you know how you can get ten more. Send right away. Hurry to your grocer. Get a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. The delicious, crisp, nourishing breakfast cereal shot from gun. Then cut off the top of the package. Write your name and address on it and send it along with 15 cents. Only 15 cents to Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. We'll rush you a complete set of five Bugs Bunny comic books. They're all new, all different. You've never seen or read them before. You can't buy them anywhere else. Look, Doc, you better hurry. Yes, as Bugs Bunny says, don't miss out. Send only 15 cents in coin, your name and address, and one box top from a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Mail to... Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. I'll repeat that address. Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Now to continue our story. After leaving Sally and her mother, Sergeant Preston joined the constable. And together with King, they rode to the headquarters building at the mine. Hold on, King. Hold on. Sergeant Preston held Perry Jackson's glove out to King as the constable Jeff watched. The intelligent dog sniffed the glove. Then Preston spoke. Find him, King. Find him, fella. The great husky circled around, sniffing. Then, barking furiously, he headed along a trail that led toward the hills. Picked up Jackson's scent. Let's go, Jeff. Come on, Come on Get up there. For some time, the two men followed King. Then, the big husky turned off the trail and headed toward a ridge where there were several abandoned claims. Easy, boy. Easy, boy. Easy, boy. Sergeant Preston was the first to notice a faint, thin column of smoke rising from a deserted prospector's cabin near the ridge. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Oh. King. Hey, fella. Jeff, someone's in that cabin, I Notice the column of smoke coming from the chimney? Say, I didn't notice that until you called my attention to it. It's almost too faint to be seen. 
I guess that's where Jackson's hiding out, all right. I'm sure of it. Leave the horses here. Steady. We'll circle around and approach the cabin on foot. All right. Steady, boy. Do you think he'd use a gun against us if he has one with him? Maybe he would under the circumstances, Jeff. It's best to be cautious. Let's try to reach the cabin without being seen. Come on. Moving carefully, the two Mounties and the dog finally approached the cabin from the back and made their way to the front door in such a way that they couldn't be seen from inside. For a moment, Sergeant Preston and the constable stood outside the closed door. Preston cautiously tried the latch and found the door wasn't locked. Then he suddenly opened the door. The interior of the cabin was shadowy, and as the two men peered in, Jeff spoke cautiously. Think there's anyone inside? Yes, King's Gall says he's in there. Listen. Hey, he must be sleeping. I heard someone, it seemed like. Yes, let's go in. I see him now, back there on the cot. He must be worn out not to have let us come in. Put your gun handy, I'll waken him. Is it Jackson? Yes. Jackson! Jackson, wake up! Uh, huh? uh, get away from me. Easy, there. Jackson. The constable has his gun handy. Oh. Oh, Sergeant Preston and King. Yes, King trailed you here, Jackson. You know, of course, why we came after you. Yes, yes, I know. But I, I didn't steal that money. I didn't, I tell you. I wouldn't be here now like this if I had. What do you mean? I haven't eaten anything for two days, Sergeant. If I'd had money, I could have got some supplies back at Elk's Creek. The first night I was here, a grizzly scared off my horse. I would have been back except for that. You mean you'd have come back to face the charge? Yes, yes. But then I couldn't be an foot and without a gun. Oh, look, take me back, Sergeant. I, I can't stand it any longer, the worry about Helen and Sally. I, I can't stand it, I tell Sit you. Sit down, Jackson. Take it easy, fellow. <laughs> oh, if I could only figure out somehow about that missing money... There were only two keys to the money bag. I had one and Mr. Dexter had the other. He must have made a mistake counting the money. Nope. Gil Morris swears he saw the bundles of money put into the bag. Eleven of them. But there were only ten when I opened the bag. Oh, Mr. Dexter is rich. There's no reason why he'd want to take the missing money. Anyhow, he'd know I'd get the blame. I didn't take it, Does I swear I... Does Mr. Dexter know you, Jackson? No, I've never seen the man. Of course, Gil Morris must have told Mr. Dexter about hiring me. A man like Barry Dexter but certainly wouldn't have reason Barry to... Barry Dexter? Is that his name? Yes. What's strange about that? Why, I knew a wealthy surgeon back in Seattle whose name was the reverse. Dexter Barry. Dr. Barry had reason to hate me, but he left Seattle and I haven't heard of him since. I... No, no, no. This couldn't be the same one. The name is different in a way, and... Anyway, he didn't even see me around. Did Dr. Barry have a reason to leave Seattle? Yes, a very good reason, too. To avoid arrest. Did he have a wife and family? He had a wife and a boy, a boy about 13. That's interesting. Why did he have to leave Seattle, and what did you have to do with it? My uncle was sheriff there, and I had a part-time job in a bank. Uncle was sick, and he made me a deputy to help out. I see. And what? Two men held up the bank. One of them got wounded, but they both got away. The next day, a, a posse I was leading caught them in their hideout some distance away. Where does Dr. Berry come in? Oh, I, I'm coming to that, Sergeant. We found that the wounded bank robber had been treated by a doctor and properly bandaged. I understand. Go on. They both swore that a well-known surgeon, Dr. Berry, had fixed the wound. Now, my uncle finally sent me to the doctor's house with a warrant, but the doctor had left town. And the crooks who robbed the bank had killed one of the tellers, so they were sentenced to hang. But just before they were hanged, they confessed they lied. The doctor hadn't known they were crooks and hadn't demanded any money from them at all. I wonder why the doctor didn't stay to defend himself. Well, folks were bitter against him at the time. We had no way of contacting the doctor to let him know. But well, it was printed up in the paper. I have a copy of it in my cabin in town. I see. Jackson, if Dr. Barry got the idea you were after him, he'd do what he could to keep you from disclosing his identity, or at least put you in such a position that nobody would believe anything you said against him. Yes, I guess he... But 
You mean you think Barry Dexter is... Is Dr. Dexter Barry? Yes, I do think so, and I intend to make sure. Only Mac. Jackson, we'll take you back to Selkirk now. I think I can promise that within a very short time, the charge against you will be dropped. Sergeant Preston and the constable took Perry Jackson back to town unobserved. Leaving the young man at the constable's office with Jeff, Sergeant Preston went on foot with King at his side to the town office of the mining company. Suppose you come with a report concerning the man who stole our money, eh, Sergeant? Not exactly a report, Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry, you made a mistake. You uh, just gave yourself away, Doctor. I came to suggest you come to the constable's office with me to clear up a certain matter. As Preston was speaking, a peculiar expression crossed Dexter's face, and his hand, hanging out of sight, eased a gun from a desk drawer. Suddenly, he sprang to his feet with a gun in his hand. No, no, I'll shoot you and then shoot myself. I can't stand for the disgrace. Dexter's move had taken the Mounty by complete surprise. He knew he faced possible death. Dexter kept his eyes on the Mounty and failed to notice the great dog that moved along the side of the desk. The intelligent king sensed the danger to his master and went into action. With a growl, he sprang at the crazed man, grabbing his gun arm and knocking him to the floor. Take him away. Make him stop it. Down, king. Easy, fellow. Get up, Dr. Barry. That, that dog. He won't hurt you. Look, Sergeant. I... What have I done? What have I done? Suddenly, the man known as Dexter sat at the desk and rested his head in his arms. Sergeant Preston waited a few minutes. Then he spoke. If it hadn't been for my dog, you might have killed me, Doctor. Yes, I know. I went out of my head for the moment. Once I was a great sergeant, one of the best, they said. Then and my reputation was ruined. The past year has been... Well, you can see what it has done to my nerves. You don't care what you do to the nerves of others. I came here to get you to admit you framed Jackson. I have nothing to say about that. He took the money. You ought to know how it feels to be wrongly accused, Dr. Barry. You you said wrongly accused. You know I was wrongly accused? Yes, I know you were. Your name's been cleared back in Seattle. Are you sure of that? Positive. Harry Jackson tried to locate you to tell you. He has the proof. Thank heaven. You've done Jackson a great wrong. It's up to you to right that wrong. Yes, I... I did wrong him. I thought he came here to find me. You'll have to come down and clear him at the constable's office. No, no, I can't admit in front of everyone that I withheld money from the bag. I... You've admitted it to me. I'll want it in writing, Doctor. No, I, I can't do that. I won't. We'll discuss that later. Don't forget, Doctor, you attempted to kill me a few minutes ago. Come along, we'll decide what's what at the constable's office. At the constable's office, Sergeant Preston, with the constable as a witness, again brought up the matter of the missing bundle of money. Now, Doctor, what decision have you made about the charge against Jackson? I uh, have decided to drop the charges against Jackson. I'm sure I miscounted when I put the bundles in the money bag. You mean you tried to frame Jackson, didn't you? Now, see here. Well, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. I guess I committed some sort of crime by doing it. But I'm already held. No charge has been made against you yet, Doctor. You've suffered a great deal. Perhaps there's a way you can make up for all you've done. If if there was some way to straighten out the mess I had made of things... Doctor, there's another person I want you to meet, and then we'll go visiting. I think things are going to straighten out for others as well as yourself. It was about an hour later when Sally Jackson answered a knock at the door of her little cabin... I'll go, Mommy. Hello, Sally. King and I have come back, and we've brought company. Hi, honey. Oh, Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Who is that, Daddy? Shh, quiet, Sally. Let's all go in and see Helen. Sally, didn't you hear me? I... Helen. <gasps> Helen. Harry. Oh, my dear Perry. <laughs> now, hold on, honey. Look at all these people watching us. 
The Sergeant Preston and the constable and... You tell her about him, Sergeant. Mrs. Jackson, this is the owner of the mining company. Oh, Mr. Dexter. Well, he's the one now, who... wait, Mrs. Jackson. Your, your husband didn't steal any money. That was... That was all a mistake. But enough about that. Sergeant Preston brought me here for another purpose. I came especially to see you. To see me? Yes, Mrs. Jackson. You see... This is really the great surgeon, Dr. Barry. He's going to take your case. Oh, golly. D- does that mean maybe Mommy will walk again? I think maybe she will be able to walk again someday. How can we ever thank you? If I can make you walk again, I'll feel that I have, in that way, repaid a great debt to Sergeant Preston, Mrs. Jackson. And to this magnificent dog that saved me. Dr. From... Barry, forget the past. Just remember, we're all looking forward to the future. Then, then you mean that no charges will be brought against From me? From the attitude of everyone here, Doctor, I'd say this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. Look, Doc, you better hurry. Yes, as Bugs Bunny says, hurry. While there's still time, get in on the sensational offer we have for you. Five. Count them. One, two, three, four, five Bugs Bunny comic books offered only by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. All yours if you act now for only 15 cents and one box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. And these are handy pocket-sized Bugs Bunny comic books you've never seen or read before. They're just off the presses. All new. All different. All complete. 32 full-color pages in every book. 160 thrilling pages in your set of five. And listen, in addition to the five Bugs Bunny comic books, we'll also send you information on how to get ten more. Wow, Doc, what an offer. So hustle up, get going. All you need to do is send 15 cents in coin. Not stamps, that's all. Only 15 cents, your name and address, and one box top from a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. The delicious, crisp, nourishing cereals shot from guns. Address your letter to Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Did you get that? Listen carefully. Send to Bugs Bunny, Chicago 77, Illinois. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the bad boy. Everybody who knew young Marty Andrews agreed that he was a thoroughly bad boy, sure to turn into a hardened criminal. But I had a hunch that Marty could be straightened out and that Pop McIntosh was the man to do it. I felt pretty disappointed to learn that Marty was planning to repay Pop's kindness by robbing him. But the climax brought a few surprises for everyone concerned and a close brush with death for King and me. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Today, you are invited to a birthday celebration, the fourth birthday of the United Nations, and celebrate we may. For young as it is, the U.N. has already stopped three wars, played an important part in settling troubles that could have led to others. So let's make sure that there will be many, many more happy birthdays for the U.N. Let's try to learn all we can about the U.N. Your future, the future of the world, depends on making the U.N. work. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.